Um, where was I? <laughs> sorry, I've lost track. Talk about Frank Miller. Oh, Frank Miller, sorry, yeah. Um, the, the full script, you know, what I'm doing now, for Tom Grummet, I, I do plots. So I break the page down, the book down into pages. I give him what's happening on each page. I throw in dialogue where I think it's necessary, and I let it go. But even that runs 11 pages. Uh, but Tom only does 12 issues a year. For the other four issues, which are generally sent to Spanish artists, I do full scripts. Full scripts can run 40, 50 pages. It's the problem is you have to you have to gauge how much information the artist needs in order to tell the story. If it's someone I know, if it's someone who knows me, if someone if it's a Rick Leonardi or a Salvador La Roca or a Jim Lee or a John Byrne or or a Frank Miller, you can sketch it out. I mean They know, they know me, they know the stories, they know the characters. It's a matter of, of finding the right emotional and physical elements and, and then figuring out, hey, this would be cool, let's try this. Why not go here, why not go there? For a full script, when you're writing a full script for a, especially a foreign artist, it's, it's one of those perverse double-edged swords because on the one hand I'm writing everything I think the artist needs, which is w probably way too much. And then his, his agent is translating it. So I'll be writing a 10, pa a, you know, a ten paragraph essay on, on what the expansion looks like, and he's translating it into two sentences of Spanish that's basically said, this is the X-Men's mansion, look at these issues. <laughs> you know, and I'll get it back, and it's like, well, oh. <laughs> and that's it. It's in the old days. I'm using those phrases, when you could guarantee generally that the Mark Silvestri will be on the book for three years, or Jim Lee, or or John Byrne then what you do is the first couple of issues are maybe heavily plotted, heavily detailed, because you're, you're trying to give the artist a sense of, of the world, especially if I've been on the book for a while and they haven't, of, of the world I'm describing, the characters as individuals, what their ro rooms look like. Billy Tan was, we were talking about this on the, uh, on the way in. When I sent him for his three issues of Un Uncanny that he did, uh, the second half of uh, End of Days, End of Grays, rather. What astonished him was that I gave him a detailed description of Kitty and Rachel's room. Kitty's, a, Kitty's side is a moderate mess. There's a computer half constructed over here because she's taking it apart and putting it back together. And there are pictures up here of these are the pictures. Uh, Rachel's side of the room is boxes. Why is it boxes? Because she hasn't unpacked. Why hasn't she unpacked? Because she doesn't know if she wants to be here. And bear in mind, she's just buried her entire family. She's not feeling terrifically like home folks. You know, she hates the fact that she's back in, she's back in Exile Central. You know, that, that she's in the ghetto. Um, and he was amazed that, that someone, that a writer would go to such detail. But from my point of view is I'm trying to give the artist a sense of my sense of who these people are as people. They don't just live in a room. They live in a room that is a, a reflection of their personality, as all, hopefully, our rooms are. And you put these pieces together, and you hope the reader, while lo when looking at it, will say, oh, God, she's as messy as I am, or not as messy as I am. Or, my cousin does his room like that. Or, hey, sh this is cool, look at the stuff she's got on, on her wall. Or, God, Rachel hasn't unpacked her boxes yet. Why is that? Oh, she must be. 
you, you try and draw linkages between the characters and the audience so that from those linkages you will grow, establish the foundations of an ongoing relationship. You make friends. Excellent. Well, and hopefully will be again if anybody gets their act together. And hopefully, but in my in my sense of the word, the frustration in a way of ex exiles is the Crystal Palace being sort of the center of the universe. They don't they don't have as much access up till now to tchotchkes and stuff and, and personalization. Uh, so I came up with a scene that we're still arguing about in-house that uh, Gambit and uh, Mystic go, go scuba dive, well, Mystic scuba diving and uh, Gambit swimming underwater. And as they're swimming underwater in this apparently desolate sea, Suddenly, there, there, there's, there's plant life along the floor of the ocean. And as they watch, the plants grow. And suddenly, there are little, little fish. And then the fish have, grow bigger fish. And all of a sudden, in the, in the space of a page, because this being a 22-page book, we have to move fast, there is life in the oceans. Well, we've said time and again that Crystal Palace is alive. And it, it takes its life, the cues of its life, from the personalities of those, and the realities of those who live in it. So if you're there long enough, it starts to remake itself to make it more simpatico to you. So yes, there may be a desert in one floor, but if you go to the next floor, there's a forest. And if you're in there long enough, there might be animals in the forest and creatures, maybe not in intelligent, i.e. people you can talk to, though you never know. But it's, it is a living organism. It wants to be, it wants to be compatible and, and hospitality and hospitable to its residents. Because to me, that seems like a cool and logical thing to play with. Still trying to talk the editors into agreeing with me, but that's, that's part of the thought process. You try to make the school a real, accessible place. So in Gen X, we have moments where they're hanging out in the library, hanging out in the dining hall, hanging out in the, the coffee shop in town that they all like to hang out in. Recognizable, definable places that the reader can look at and say, oh, I know that, I do that. I take that kind of bus. We throw things at each other in, in school. If you make it more real, if you make the as-if reality more real, then what happens to the characters, even if they're fantastic, have a real foundation. Because you're saying, they, their lives are a lot like mine, except for the superhero part. Gee, if I had superheroes, if I had superpowers, I'd be like that. Cool. It, it, it creates bonding. And the problem I feel is that I, you know, I read Superman, I read Batman, I read Spider-Man, I don't, I don't see anything to link with. I don't see anything that speaks to me as an individual or to me as a resident of a city, of a place. I hope, now that the X-Men are moving to San Francisco, that when they get there, it will, it will significantly reflect San Francisco. It will make it alive. I do not, for the life of me, understand this issue where they're walking around looking like Mardi Gras puppets. But I'll read it and maybe it'll all become clear. Just glancing through the issue, it's kind of like, are we in time travel now? But that's, you know, people probably were as confused about half the stories I read. Uh, a long time ago, I did a book called Tales from the Anniverse with my collaborator, Randy Zimmerman. And that was way back in the 70s when the independent comic booms just started, about the time of Cerebus. I haven't done a lot in comics since, but I keep showing up here in part because comics was how I cut my teeth. Also, being in comics led to a career that uh, was related to this fandom. Uh, I have done a lot of gaming art, including Magic the Gathering, so everything kind of comes together nicely.